you fail, when you do something wrong, think something wrong, say something wrong, listen, don't run from God, run to God. Say, God, I love you today. I I ask you to forgive me. I'm gonna walk in your grace. I receive grace for my weakness. I receive grace for my failure and move forward and don't get stuck in the mud. You need to choose celebration over condemnation. We've been in this series called Jesus, Tough as Nails. And what we're doing leading up to Easter is we're looking at the seven things that Jesus said on the cross. You know, he said seven things. And we're looking at them in order. And so we're we're on like number six this weekend. And I would love to tell you that I planned out number six with this day to see the building. I would love to tell you that months ago, our team sat down and meticulously planned the day, the hour, the week that we would actually say that our building is finished and that Jesus phrase that we're gonna look at, guess what we're gonna look at today? Can you guess it, right? He said, it is finished, right? I'd love to tell you that we planned that months ago, years ago when we first cast the vision for the church. Hey, listen, I'm gonna do It Is Finished right when we have the building tour, but we didn't. We're just, you know, okay, we didn't, so I'm, I just can't say that, but how, how cool is it? Now, I do wanna qualify this, okay? We're gonna get deep into what that word means, it is finished. You're gonna love this Bible study that we get into today. Um, And you're gonna find out that when Jesus said it is finished, he means it's finished. The work of salvation, I mean, it's done. Nothing more needs to be added, it's awesome. Now, let's qualify this. When we say it is finished, it means it's pretty much done, okay? There's a difference. It's kind of done. It's done enough for you to go look at it, right? It's, not, it's, it's done. There's some things. So you'll see some things when you go over there. It's like, okay, I don't, I don't think that's done yet, or that, that might not be done. But you know what? It, it's done enough, and, and we need this thing open for Easter here very soon. So we want to thank you for uh, coming out and celebrating with us today. John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Jesus had cried out before this, I am thirsty. And they brought him a sponge uh, with sour wine in it, and they, they held it on a stick up to his lips. And so that's how we know that this is the next thing, because it says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. Let's pray over the word of God real quick. Lord, we pray that in the next few minutes as we open the scriptures, that we recognize that your word is alive and it's wisdom for our lives and it's, it's our foundation, it's what we need to build on. I pray that you would cause your words to come alive in our hearts, that you would cause my words to be your words today. You would help us by the power of the Holy Spirit to grasp what you want us to have in our hearts today and to have a great understanding of your love for us in our lives and how it affects our daily lives, and we ask in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. I, I wanna submit this thought to you today that it is finished is a battle cry. You know what a battle cry is? A battle cry is something, it's like a phrase that's said kind of in a movement or in a battle that kind of brings the troops together. It's a truth, you know. For example, in Texas, at a time in Texas, they used this as a battle cry. They said, remember the Alamo. Right? You ever heard that? Remember the Alamo. Um, in World War II, the British, they had a phrase, like a battle cry that they would use. Um, and because of their stiff upper lip, you know, the British, they would just say, uh, they would say, keep calm and carry on. All right? Let's try that one. That's kind of cool. Let's say it together. Ready? Keep calm, carry on. That's awesome. Um, during the Civil Rights Movement, there was a battle cry led by Martin Luther King Jr. He he gave a great speech that reverberates throughout the decades of our nation. And there was a battle cry in that speech. It was three words. You probably know what three words. Let's say it together. Here's the battle cry. I have a dream, all right? I have a dream. Four words. Okay, so, so I'm into threes right now, but it's four. All right. Yeah, pastor needs some math help. All right, so if you've watched the movie Braveheart and the story of William Wallace, it was played just so well by Mel Gibson. There's a battle cry at the end when he's about to be executed, and they're like, 
This guy wants to say something, you know, and, and he opens his mouth and he yells out the word freedom. And I'm not going to try that because, I mean, he makes it last for about 30 minutes. You know, it's just powerful. Just like, you know, and there, that's a battle cry, right? Um, the Lone Ranger had one, high old silver, all right? Not quite as impactful. But anyway, um, battle cry. See, they, they build unity. They, they, they add strength. They, they give us something to rally around, something to remember. And I think when Jesus said, it is finished, in John chapter 19. I think it was an awesome battle cry because John tells us what he said, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tell us how he said it. And what they tell us is that it wasn't a whimper. It wasn't uh, like a victim. It wasn't like, oh man, it's, it's finished. I mean, I want you to imagine this. His tongue before this was, was cleaving to the roof of his mouth. He, he, he was... He was thirsty, he, he, he had been on the cross for hours and so he asked for a drink and, and they put this sponge with sour wine up uh, to his mouth and now there's some wetness up there. Now he can actually say something. And so he, he gets a, a deep breath, which, which was a lot of work on the cross. It was part of the tortures. It was difficult to get a breath. And then he cries out in this loud voice, it is Finish. Theologians say that he yelled it with an intensity. He, he yelled it with a force, not of a victim, but as a victor. It was a word that reverberated in the halls of heaven and hell. It is a phrase and a word that made demons tremble and angels rejoice, and it shocked everyone there at the foot of the cross. In fact, this is not in your notes today, not on the screens, but in Mark chapter 15, verse 39, it tells us that one of the centurions in charge of the crucifixion, when he heard the power and the authority that Jesus yelled out, it is finished, is that he believed that he was the son of God. He said, surely this man was the son of God. He yelled it with such a force, with such a power, that it caused one of those that were crucifying him to convert on the spot and to believe that he was the son of God. And I wanna tell you, these words have that same power today, that when we understand the power of what Christ did on the cross, listen, it can open blind eyes, it can set the captives free, it can cause uh, life to come from death. And so today, we're gonna look at these words, it is finished, but see, in the Greek, it's not three words at all. In the Greek, it's just one word. And I'm gonna tell you what it is. Here it is on the screen. It's to tell us die, to tell us die. Let's all say it together, you ready? To tell us die, one more time, to tell us die. It means paid in full, it means complete. It means nothing more is needed. One theologian said, it is the greatest single word ever uttered, to tell us die. Let me tell you how that word might have been used in the ancient world. That word would be used by a servant if they were given an assignment by their master, uh, a task to complete that they would uh, work on that task. When it was done, they would go back to their master and say, to tell us die. It was used by artists when they were um, putting their heart into a painting or a sculpting, and they you know, put hours or days or weeks or months or years, and when they felt like it was just right, you know, voila, they would say, to tell us die. It was used by the banking industry, you know, for, for um, thousands of years, people have gotten things on credit, old people money, in fact, um, archaeologists have uncovered business documents from the ancient times of, of you know, debts, and, and sometimes they would uncover a document that at the bottom of the document it would say, to tell us die, nothing more is needed, paid in full. That word would also be used by the priest on Passover. You see, the Jewish people would celebrate what God did through Moses when he delivered them from Egypt. You know the story. There was 10 judgments on Egypt because Pharaoh wouldn't let God's people go. And at the last judgment, God gave Moses instructions so that his people would be protected when the death angel would come through. He said, listen, you're going to have to kill a lamb. You're going to have to paint your house red. Actually, he said, you're going to have to kill this lamb and paint the blood, put the blood of this lamb on your doorpost. When the death angel comes over, he will pass over you. Why? The death angel couldn't enter their homes because something had already died there. And they put the blood on the doorpost of their homes. So the Jewish nation would celebrate that, 
And when the celebration of Passover came, um, Josephus, the historian, tells us that um, thousands of Jewish people would go into the temple area, the temple complex, with their lambs. The lambs were supposed to be the best they had, spotless and without blemish. And um, they would have to be examined by the priest. And so this happened at 3 o'clock. See, Jesus died on that day. Jesus died at 3 o'clock on Good Friday. Between three and five o'clock, all these people would be bringing in lambs and the priest would have to inspect the lambs because they were offering lambs to be sacrificed as, as their worship and, and remembering what God had done. And the priest, after he would examine these lambs, when they would met the requirements, he would step back and he would say, to tell us die, nothing more is needed. And just not too far from where they were, on the outside of the city, on Mount Calvary, Jesus was hanging on the cross, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. As they were saying to Telestai, as all these lambs were coming in, you see, scripture tells us this was a mystery that was hidden in the Old Testament, but is now revealed. They didn't know that really on the outside of the city that something very big was happening, and Jesus cried out to Telestai, it is finished and our sins were paid for. In Ephesians chapter one, verse number seven, Ephesians one, it says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Let's read this one together, church, let's do it, ready? In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of his grace. It's amazing as Jesus cried out, it is finished. What it means is that our sin is atoned for, that Satan is defeated, that redemption is secure. You say, well, what did he mean, it is finished? What exactly is finished? Let me tell you three things that were finished. Number one, the Old Testament was finished. The old way of worship, the old way of serving God. Jesus said that I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill the law. Jesus fulfilled all the requirements of the law. Loving God, loving people. He fulfilled it. He said, I didn't come to abolish it, I came to fulfill it. He met the requirements and now, so God is moving redemption, he's moving salvation from a system, that's the Old Testament, you have to do all these things and bring this lamb, and we, he's moving it from a system, he's moving it to a savior. Now we come to God not through this system of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, but now we come to God through a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been said that through the incarnation, what we celebrate at Christmas, God came to man. But through the crucifixion now, man can come to God. Hebrews chapter nine and verse 12. Hebrews chapter nine says, he did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The Old Testament was done. The Old Covenant, the old system of coming to God. Here's the second thing that was finished, and that is your sin and my sin. Your sin and my sin. The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That there's, it's kind of like there's a list of all of our sins somewhere, right? Um, it's funny, I had a conversation with Dar Bryant and, uh, you know, because you might think, man, some people really have more sins than others, but that doesn't really matter because we've all sinned. But Dar Bryant is our prison ministry director. And uh, back in the day, he was one of Arizona's top 10 most wanted criminals. He did a lot of bad things. He's got a book if you want to read about it. It's called 360. They're sold out of it right now. They'll have more in a couple weeks. You can get it on Amazon if you can't wait. And uh, Dar um, has had an amazing life change uh, here at River Church, when he came and he gave his life to Jesus, the Savior, God has changed his life, forgiven him, and, and put him on a new path, and now he's sharing his story, and many people are coming to Christ, but it's kind of funny, because um, we were at a banquet a few months ago, and you know, Dar's story is getting pretty well known. He's a book author now, and he's going out and speaking, and um, there was an award presented to um, Judge Hilla, who's over all the judges in Madison County, and I was there at the banquet, and they said, Judge Hilla, we wanna give you this award for all of your service, and they called it the Dar Bryant Award. And so a judge <laughs> has Dar's plaque and picture on his wall. Dar said, you know, it's the first time my picture has been on the wall of a judge, not on a most wanted poster. It's pretty cool, so. <laughs> Colossians chapter two, you're gonna love this scripture. Colossians chapter two and verse 14. Jesus has canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. 
He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Picture this, a list of all your sins, a list of all your failures, a list of all your mistakes, a bill, if you wanna call it a bill, of everything we owe, a bill that we couldn't pay. All of sin falling short of the glory of God, and God says there must be a payment. That payment is blood, that payment is death. There's a bill, and we can't hide our sin from God. There's no way we can hide it. And, and so each and every one of us, we know what's on that list. It, you might not have been one of Arizona's top 10 most wanted, but we all know what's on that list of our failures, our sins, our mistakes, our shortcomings, everything on that list. But see, God's not interested in making that list something that he looks at all the time. God says, you know what, I'm gonna take your list and I'm gonna nail it to the cross. In fact, one theologian said it like this, Jesus took the full wrath of God for our sins. In fact, Jesus said, let this cup pass for me. It's, you know, you've heard of like, you're gonna take the cup of judgment, the cup of the wrath of God. When he prayed in the garden, Father, let this cup pass from me. But there was no other way. He said, so, okay, your will, not my will. Jesus took the cup of the wrath of God for you and for me. One theologian said it like this, said, you know what, when Jesus said to tell us die, it's like, man, he drained the cup and then he turned it upside down. He said, to tell us die, it's over. That's what he did. Now, guess what? Sin is not a problem anymore. Sin doesn't keep us away from God. Isaiah says your sins have separated you from God. Not anymore. Through Jesus Christ, we can come boldly into God's throne and receive grace and mercy in our time of need. Come on, somebody celebrate today that your sin is paid for, all right? Your sin is covered. Your sin is canceled. He said, one, this one guy said, you know, it's like, it's like, um, you know, when somebody drinks a, a can of soda or something and they just, they crush the can when they're done. Like, you know, I finish it. And you've seen that scene in Jaws when, you know, Quinn finishes his beer, he crushes the can, you know, and, and then Hooper has a styrofoam cup of water and he drinks it and crushes a styrofoam cup. You know, it's like, I can crush something too. He's got, it's done, right? Here's one more thing that's done and that is death and the devil is done. Look at Hebrews chapter two, verse 14. Hebrews two, verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he shared in their humanity so that, look at this, by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. In Colossians 2.15, it says that Jesus made a public display of the enemy. Um, back in the ancient world, when a king would defeat another king, they would come back into their town, parade into their town, and the defeated king would be in chains behind them, and they would celebrate the victory. Scripture says that Jesus made a show of them openly in a victory parade. Hey, everybody, Jesus said, it is finished. The old way of serving God, you don't have to have a system anymore. You have a savior. Sin separating you from God, keeping you from a close relationship. Nope, you come to him, put your faith in him, and your sins are wiped away. You know what? The, the fear of death, um, the enemy having control and power over your life, you know what? It's over. Jesus said, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. Come on, somebody. Let's give God a praise today because Jesus Christ defeated the enemy and darkness and sin on the cross. Now, what's our response to this? What's our response to to tell us die? How should we live in light of this? In other words, what kind of application can I bring into my life because of what Christ has done for me on the cross? Let me give you three thoughts today. Three thoughts of how does this change how I live? Number one, and they're choices. Everything I'm gonna say is this is a choice we have to choose, but it's based on the truth of the word of God. And number one is that we should choose celebration over condemnation. Celebration over condemnation. You know what? None of us here are perfect. You come to Christ, it doesn't mean that you're perfect on the outside. He makes us new on the inside, but we still mess up, we fail, we, we think wrong things, we say wrong things. And you know what the Bible calls Satan, one of his nicknames? The accuser of the brethren. You know one of the things he likes to do? Rub your nose in your sin. Rub your nose in your failure. Remind you of all of your faults. Hey, you know what? If that's his nickname, what do you think he's doing? That's what he does. You know, if you have a guy on the baseball team, he's called left-handed Timmy, he's probably not throwing right-handed, okay? I mean, the, the enemy is, one of his things is he wants to remind you of your failures. He wants to remind you of your sin. And see, um, the Bible says that when we're in Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, when I fail, I'm not supposed to just allow condemnation and shame and guilt to drive me away from God. Listen to this really closely. This is the problem with so many people, is that they wanna serve God, they wanna love God, 
But then when they fail, they just say, well, I just can't do this, and they just give up, and they just, well, I just, you know, I'm not going to church anymore. I'm not going to try. No, 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 you're, you're not supposed to run from God when you fail. God doesn't say, well, I'm mad at you when you fail. No, God pours out more grace. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds that much more. There's more than enough grace for all of your weaknesses and failures, and so when we choose celebration over condemnation, listen, when I fall, the Bible says I'm going to confess my sins to God. I'm going to come to him, and he will cleanse me of sin, cleanse me of all unrighteousness. The prodigal son left his dad, basically said, I wish you were dead. His dad could have had him killed in that society, but his dad took the shame on himself. This kid took his inheritance, went off, did everything he thought would make him happy. All all the girls, all all the, the parties, everything he thought, and he ended up with pigs. He ended up hungry, and, and that, that's what happens. We decide, you know what? I think my own way is going to work better, and so he decides finally one day, um, I'm going to go back to my dad and just see if I can get a job. I know I'm not worthy to be his son anymore, but let me just see if I can get a job because his servants at least have money to eat. I need that, and so Scripture tells us that when he came back home that the father saw him at a distance and started running to meet him. And he opened his arms. You know, um, in that society, when someone that had humiliated their family like this guy had done, people would, would throw rocks at them and yell at them if they were coming back into the community. And the father ran to protect him from all of that. He went out and got him and he says, hey, listen, my son that was lost is now found. And he made the decision, put the robe on him, put the family ring. That's like, son, you're on the account now. Put the robe on him. Come on, my son is back. And he brought him fully back into his family. Now, what would happen if that son said, you know, I'm not worthy of this. I don't want this robe. I don't want this ring. Just let me go get the clothes I was wearing with the pigs. I just need to grovel in all of my failures. No, God doesn't get any glory from shame being on your life. God doesn't get any glory from you piling guilt and shame on your life when Jesus has already paid for all of your shame and guilt. Listen, we all fail and make mistakes, but if you'll be resolute and say, wait a minute, I still believe that the blood of Jesus is just as powerful today as it was 2,000 years ago. When you fail, when you do something wrong, think something wrong, say something wrong, listen, don't run from God, run to God. Say, God, I love you today. I I ask you to forgive me. I'm gonna walk in your grace. I receive grace for my weakness. I receive grace for my failure and move forward forward and don't get stuck in the mud. You need to choose celebration over condemnation. The second thing we need to do is choose confidence over confusion. Choose confidence over confusion. Think about it. Jesus went through great suffering, but he knew there would come a tetelestai at the end. He went through great pain and suffering on the cross. And I want to tell you today that when you understand when you're going through a battle and a trial in your life, that there is a purpose and an end that it won't last forever, it will give you great strength. In other words, keeping your eyes on the end will give you strength in the middle. Keeping your eyes on the end will give you strength in the middle. There's things happening in life that we're like, I don't understand what's going on in my life. Sometimes we're thinking, well, I thought this would happen like this, and I thought, and it doesn't happen, and we can get confused. We can get perplexed, we can be like, well, God, I thought it was, what's going on? Are you with me, right? Are you with me? What, what's going on in my life? And, and what I want to tell you is if you're in that place today or if you've been in that place, you're not alone. In fact, the guys who was bringing the message of the gospel, they were in that place when they were doing the very work of God. In fact, they talk about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, listen, we are hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed. You know what perplexed means? Like, what is going on? It's confused, perplexed. Like, what's going on? He says, we're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. In other words, we, we have the power when we go through difficulties and things that are confusing in our life. We have the power to choose confidence. Why could they choose confidence? Look at this, verse 14. Verse 14, because we know You want to be a rock in storms, you want to be a rock in hard times, is you have to know something. You have to be assured of something. They said, we're hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us 
with you to himself. In other words, we have our eyes on the prize. We know God is with us. We know he's for us. We know he won't forsake us. We don't understand everything that's going on in our life, but we will not abandon God. We will not give up. We are going to keep pressing forward. Look, so here's what we do. He says, this is what we do with our focus. Um, Next verse. Next verse 17, he says, because we have all these troubles, but they're gonna achieve for us something greater in glory. Look at verse 18. Here's how we deal with it. We fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. When you're going through perplexing situations, sometimes if you just stare at the perplexing thing over and over, it will just pour more confusion into your life. There's times that we need to let up on trying to figure everything out and put our trust in God and say, okay, well, I can't figure that out. I'm not gonna constantly focus on that. I'm gonna focus on what is unseen because what is unseen what is unseen is eternal. I believe that God's plan is happening in my life. I believe God has a purpose. He has a plan. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. And one day his resurrection power will raise me up and take me to heaven. Come on, somebody give God a praise for his resurrection power today. Amen. In the midst of your suffering, know there is a finish. Choose confidence over confusion. And then lastly, I think an adequate response, an appropriate response for to tell us die. Jesus said, it is finished. The work of salvation is done, is that we must choose as believers calling over comfort, calling over comfort. Matthew chapter 28, Jesus is risen from the dead. He's giving the final words to his disciples. And he comes to them and he says, listen, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority, in other words, I did what God said, now all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. I took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. I paid for the sin problem. We finished the the Old Testament, it's done, it's fulfilled. All authority is now mine. So one thought you would say is like, all right, everybody, get in your recliner, sit back, it's done. No, it's a little bit of a twist now. He says, all authority has been given to me, now you go. You make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like Jesus said, the work is finished. It is done, now get to work, right? It's done, all authority's been given to me. Now you get the job done. Now there's a different work happening. It's the work of telling others the message of the cross. It's the work of telling others that God's power, God's love, is for them and God's wanting to give them a new beginning. God wants to be reconciled. The Bible says we're his ambassadors as though we were just proclaiming out, hey, listen, be reconciled to God. Jesus has been raised from the dead. He's not holding your sin against you. And so Jesus tells them his work was done, but their work is just beginning. And I wanna tell you today that each and every one of us have a calling on our life that in some way will help others come to Christ. Hey, thanks so much for watching today. We hope you enjoyed the service. Hey, we would love to invite you to come to an actual service. It's a very laid back environment and you're gonna enjoy it. So we hope to see you here.